Debbie. Huh. Of course she wasn't going to let me quit in peace. She made my year working at the fast food joint become a total nightmare with her endless nagging and complaining. Why wouldn't she turn my two weeks notice into the most insufferable series of tasks imaginable? That was on me for trying to do things by the book. That and the fear that my streaming career would totally bust and I'd be forced to go back to working minimum wage. Even though my views had skyrocketed after my latest Zelda gameplays and so did my number of viewers, I was making just a little more than my average paycheck at work. Still, it was infinitely better to stay at home and stream than going to work every day. I couldn't stand that greasy and sticky kitchen anymore. And not seeing Debbie ever again was the icing on the cake. Anyway, back to real life. The senseless petty job started on Wednesday, a day after I'd given her the notice, with cleaning the goddamn ice cream machine. That thing hadn't been cleaned in months, mind you, and was an eye-opener that will probably keep me away from ice cream for at least a couple of months. Followed by cleaning up the lobby and the toilets after a day filled with kids' birthday parties, doing the whole inventory by myself one week before it was needed, and, worst of all, being placed for my last shift at the 24-hour store near Mainland with Creepy Paul as my shift partner. That dude managed to creep everyone out, even other male workers. The rain outside was heavy to the point that we could barely see anything aside from some random shapes and lights going up and down the streets. At least the bad weather had pushed most customers away, and I spent a good chunk of time planning content for my channel. Around 2 a.m., the drive through microphone made a loud, static-like noise, scaring both me and Paul. When I put on my headset to talk to the customer, all I heard were the loud thuds of rain hitting the street. But the microphone wouldn't turn on by itself, so someone had to be there. Hello? What can I get you? Hi! Sorry, I'm here. Could I have a... Mighty Muffin? Six hash bre Sorry, sorry, that won't be possible. Those items are from our breakfast menu, and that won't be available until 5 a.m. Now it's 2 a.m., so... So... When she said nothing in return, I called for her again. Oh, I'm still here. In that case, I'll want two bacon double cheeseburgers and a box of chicken nuggets. Everything to go. I then told her the price, and that she could wait at the window, and I would meet her there once the order was ready. Luckily, I didn't have to repeat everything to Creepy Paul since he was nearby when I took the order, and he started to cook the burgers and the bacon as I went to fry the chicken nuggets. Overall, it took less than ten minutes to make everything. Paul was a major creep, but he was also super fast in making the orders. No surprises there. I'd heard from one of our co-workers that he'd been on the grill for about five years. Apparently, he wasn't good at dealing with customers. No surprises there. So, management always placed him on kitchen duty or cleaning duty. Basically, anywhere people wouldn't see him. We packed everything, and I went to the delivery window and waited for them. The car approached very slowly, almost like it was purposely trying to stall. When the driver's side window opened, I was greeted by a tall man driving the car. So tall that his head was pretty much touching the ceiling of the car. And that made me momentarily confused since I was certain that a woman had made the order. Something shifted in the passenger seat and I could then see a woman sitting beside him. She stretched over the driver until she was leaning on his window and handed me the money. Isn't it scary to stay all night alone in the store? It would be if I was alone, but I have a co-worker with me. A male co-worker? She asked. Although she was probably trying to make conversation, something about it felt off. Really off. Maybe the fact that throughout that whole interaction, the driver didn't say a single word just stared at me the whole time. Maybe he was one of those jealous weirdos who would try to jump at any man who spoke to their girlfriend just for the sake of picking a fight. Well, whatever that was, I didn't want to be a part of it. Management didn't usually let women work alone at the 24-hour locations. For obvious reasons, of course. Lots of creeps out there. Paul included, I thought. 
I gave her the food. She told me to keep the change, and that was that. Or at least, I thought so. Not even 15 minutes later, I saw her walking through the door and into the lobby, soaking wet. I asked her if everything was all right, and she proceeded to tell me how angry she was because we had supposedly given her an order with missing items. Her behavior was completely different from before, almost like they were two different people who happened to look exactly the same. And what items were missing? A single chicken nugget. I was in no mood to argue, so I simply apologized, and I offered a complimentary chocolate chip cookie to compensate for her troubles. She said she wasn't interested in my apologies and that I was going to regret messing with her. Both Paul and I just stared at her in confusion. Who in their right mind would get that angry over a singular chicken nugget? Before either of us could answer her, the door opened again, and in walked the man who was in the car with her, the driver. He was carrying a large backpack and wearing some sort of protective helmet with a small camera attached to the front. I knew then that something bad was going to happen. My mind immediately went to the window as an escape plan, and apparently so did Paul's, because next thing I knew, the woman was pointing a gun at him, barking orders to stay absolutely still, or else. We watched in horror as the man took large sets of chains from his backpack and sealed the main entrance. I saw him doing the same to the delivery window, and I assumed also the back door since he came back to the lobby empty-handed. The four of us were locked inside the store. The last thing he took out from the backpack was an identical helmet to his, which the woman was quick to place on her head. She handed him the gun that he placed inside the backpack and took from it four large knives instead. Paul and I stared at each other again, both of us completely terrified and in shock. Like speaking to an audience, the woman then laid out the rules of the so-called game. Rule number one, no firearms, close contact weapons only. Rule number two, at the start of the game, each player can have only one weapon. Weapons can be stolen from other players, though. Rule number three, at the start of the game, each team must have the same number of players. Rule number four, players can switch sides if and when they want, but they must be accepted by the members of the other team. And finally, rule number five, Stream everything. Never stop recording. The four of us were locked inside the store and we were about to play some sick game of survival. The driver tossed two of the knives on the floor near us and told us to get them. I refused, but Paul didn't. After I remembered the rule about switching places, I grabbed the other knife. If I was about to fight Paul too, <laughs> I needed all the help I could get. The woman then had the balls to thank her damn sponsors before she gave the official go-ahead to start the game. At first, no one made a move. We just stared at one another in complete silence. The driver showed the woman something on his phone and she laughed. <laughs> it looks like the audience decided that you guys should make the first move. I noticed that the woman was wearing the keys to the exits around her neck. After about 10 minutes, and no move from either me or Paul, I could tell that they were getting impatient. Especially her. And then a series of pings on the driver's phone, to which the woman answered with a broad smile. The guy took two Molotov cocktails from the backpack, lit them up, and threw them over us and into the kitchen area. Her voice was dripping with mockery when she said, Either you fight, or we all die in here. Dealer's choice. There was no way around it. I had to fight those crazy people if I wanted a shot at getting out alive. I took a deep breath, and I ran towards her first, full force, thinking it was my best shot since she was much smaller than I was. 
The impact was so strong that we both lost our balance, having to use one another for support to remain upright. That gave me the chance to pin her arms above her head as I prepared myself for the act of stabbing someone, something I had never done before and was hoping I would never have to. But I misjudged her abilities, or at least how scrappy she was, because she managed to get me right in the stomach with her kneecap. Ugh! Fuck, that hurt. It didn't take long until she was flipping me over, using my own weight as leverage against me. My back hit the floor with a muffled thud that took my breath away. She didn't waste any time, and sank the knife right on my left shoulder, and then dragged it down, slicing the skin. The sharp pain made my eyes sting, and then water, and I could feel the warm blood pooling on my collarbones. Standing on top of me, she grabbed my own knife, a much thinner and longer blade than hers, and randomly stabbed across my chest with a shallow jab. She was saying something I couldn't understand as I watched her lift her own knife high above her head, prepared to take me out. Creepy Paul came to the rescue like a knight and lunged against the woman. Soon after, I saw Paul and her in a similar position, both struggling for dominance over the other. Similarly to me, he was also bleeding. A lot. Didn't seem like he would last much longer. Between that, the smoke filling our lungs, and the fire rapidly taking over the place, none of us would survive much longer. I looked around, and I found the driver lying motionless on the floor with a long, serrated bread knife sticking out from his stomach. <laughs> that butthole got what he deserved. And next to him, the backpack, where the gun was. I crawled towards it, leaving a trail of fresh blood behind me. I managed to get the gun out and then screamed Paul's name, sliding the gun on the floor towards him. I assumed he must have grabbed it because I heard a loud shot. And then nothing. Silence. And then, the sound of the flames getting stronger and stronger around us. Being carried out, half dead from a fire, by Creepy Paul was definitely not how I imagined my last shift to end. When I opened my eyes again, we were further out, and he was talking to the police on the driver's phone. The driver's phone? A sudden curiosity took over me, and I extended my hand, motioning for him to give me the phone. He did. I was confused once I realized it was locked, but Paul handed me the guy's severed thumb to unlock it. So, how much do you think they were making with all this? Well, only one way to find out, Paul said, and pointed towards the driver's bag. I started snooping around his laptop. The stream donations alone were enough to cover seven months' worth of our paycheck combined. And his bank statements? Well, let's just say that they were running a very lucrative operation. Exhausted and borderline delirious from blood loss, a thought occurred to me. Maybe I had just found a foolproof way of never returning to minimum wage jobs ever again. And I knew just the person to partner up with. My sister Ellen invited me to McDonald's so we could have dinner and make peace. I'd just gotten engaged to her ex-boyfriend Scott, which had caused a big rift in our relationship. Ellen had called me a homewrecker and refused to talk to me. That was about a month before, but then she called me up and said she was ready to meet. I thought that McDonald's was a weird choice, especially the one she picked, which was in a sketchier part of town. But I really wanted my sister to forgive me, even though I didn't do anything wrong. So, I agreed to meet her. When I got there, Ellen was already inside. She smiled at me and waved. She was even wearing the scarf I gave her last Christmas. I had a good feeling that this was going to be a nice conversation. Maybe she'd finally give me her blessing to marry Scott. Ellen met me inside and we both ordered. She kept looking behind the cashier and into the kitchen, as if she was trying to see something. But I didn't think anything of it. Then we sat down at a table and talked. We were the only ones there, so we didn't have to censor ourselves. Ellen told me that I'd really hurt her feelings, but she'd gotten over it. She said that she knew the love between me and Scott was real, and she couldn't fight that. It felt so nice to hear her say that. 
I told her that I'd really missed her, and I tried to ask her if she was free to hang out sometime this week, but she cut me off. She said she had to run to the bathroom for a second. It was longer than a second. I waited at that table for about 10 minutes and she never came back. There were no other customers and I didn't see the worker anywhere, so it was just me alone in the restaurant. I started to get a weird feeling, so I went to the bathroom to check on her and she wasn't there. I went back to the main area of the restaurant and looked out the windows. Her car was still parked outside so I knew she hadn't left. I knew I shouldn't do this because it was against the rules, and since none of the workers were there, I hopped the counter and looked into the kitchen. That too was empty. Where was everybody? I went to the back door to see if there were maybe smoking behind the restaurant or something, but the door wouldn't open. It wasn't locked though, something was jamming it from the outside. I ran back to the front of the restaurant and saw Ellen outside the glass front doors. She smiled and waved at me as she was pushing a trash can in front of the door. She was trapping me in here. I pushed on the door, but it wouldn't budge. Ellen stood right outside and smiled at me. What are you doing? I asked her. I'm burning away my problems, she said. That's when I smelled the smoke. It was very faint, but getting stronger, and it was coming from the men's bathroom. I rushed in and saw that all the used paper towels in the garbage can were on fire. The room was filled with smoke. I kicked it over, trying to stamp out the fire, but that just made things worse. The fire spread to the walls, which were coated by some flammable chemical. I ran back into the main room. From what I could tell, my sister had lured me to this place, spread around lighter fluid or something, lit a fire, and then locked me inside. She was trying to murder me in the most elaborate way possible. I pounded on the front door, but Ellen just watched me from the other side of the glass. By now, the whole restaurant was filling with smoke. I could barely breathe. I begged for Ellen to let me out, but she didn't say anything. She just smiled. Since the front door was a dead end, I figured that my only way out was through the back. Covering my mouth, I hopped over the counter and ran through the kitchen. I tried the back door again, but it was still blocked. It was so hot in the building, I was losing strength. Everything was blurry. I desperately tried to ram my shoulder against the door, but it wouldn't budge. Eventually, I gave up and collapsed onto the ground. I knew that I was going to die, but I hoped that it would be through suffocation. That seemed better than burning. But just as everything went dark, I saw a sliver of light in front of me. The back door was opening. Soon, a hand reached in and pulled me out of the building. I was stretched out on the parking lot with my savior looking down on me. I still couldn't see her face, but I knew that it was my sister. She changed her mind and saved me at the last minute. But when my vision cleared, I saw that it wasn't my sister at all. It was the McDonald's worker. She explained that Ellen had paid her $300 to leave us alone in the restaurant for 20 minutes. She had second thoughts about it though and came back early. That's when she found me. She had no idea that Ellen planned to burn down the place. Pretty soon, the firemen came. They used their hoses to put out the fire while one stayed behind to check on me. The police came too and they took the McDonald's worker away. I wasn't sure what kind of trouble she was in but I told her that I'd testify on her behalf if there was ever a trial. After all, she saved my life. Once the fire was completely out, the firemen gave me a breathing test and told me I could go. I started walking around the burnt building to get to my car, but the fireman shouted at me to stop. There was something in front of the building that he didn't want me to see. I didn't listen, of course, and kept walking. That's when I saw Ellen, or what was left of her. She was lying right in front of the entrance, horribly burnt. Half of her face was unrecognizable. She was dead. The fireman came up behind me and put his hand on my shoulder. Are you okay? He asked. What happened? He explained that my sister tried to run away from the fire, but her scarf had gotten caught under the trash can. She tried to get free, but her scarf caught on fire, and then so did she. He asked me again if I was okay thought for a second. Then I said, yeah, never better. Are you going to say something? Or are you just going to keep staring? His right brow jumped to affect his query. The large bar of ring piercing on the bridge of his nose dragged his face askew. 
A whole part of his face was covered in a strange pattern tattoo so that there was hardly any portion of his skin left untouched. The other part of his face had four large ink streaks under his eyes, and except for that, the rest of his skin was visible. I smiled in admiration. What's up, bro? I muttered at last, gasping inquisitively as my eyes wandered down his face. The quality of his video, which made it hard to read through the text on his neck, scribbled in Arabic, cleared up enough when he moved in his seat. He replied that he was good, and he asked me how my day was. I was hesitant to drag into the ordinary chatter, as I usually did with other Omegle users. His appearance was unique, and I knew if I spoke to him with more intent, I could be friends with this dude who had such strange tattoos and piercings. I was curious as to what adventurousness made a man alter his skin and his body, so I asked. Hey man, what does it mean, the Arabic scribbling under your neck? He blanched in his seat and looked away from the computer. That was nothing odd, I thought. Then he placed his hands on his neck and moved it open to expose it further for me. He rubbed on it briefly and smiled. Manifest evil he said, and his dark green eyes floated as though he would perceive a reaction from me. I nodded my head instead, unwilling to give myself to internet users and their playfulness. I knew people like him, those who desired to be something so badly that they would do anything to get the appearance of it. He cocked his head and waited. Four streaks under your eyes? <laughs> kind of strange. I cackled, trying to ease his expectation. Means something to me, he said, and paused. Of course I mused. All tattoos meant something to the bearer. I thought to probe. I asked what it meant, playfully, running my hands over the keyboard of my computer. For each soul I've taken, I tattoo a streak, he said. Marcel Dunbar, Rachel Swift, Kane Orson, Daniel Ha. All unbelievers. I burst into laughter because I thought it was hilarious that a man would say something so silly with such a straight face. Well, he did not seem as amused as I was. Instead, he looked puzzled, offended, perhaps, that I did not believe him. He read my thoughts. You don't believe me? I stopped laughing at once, and I shot him a glance of incredulity. Who would believe a man who has four streaks to evidence his killings on his face? It was the internet. People tried to be funny all the time. When time drifted slowly past and this man did not smile, I became worried. I contemplated the skip icon, but I was too intrigued to do so. I wanted to see the end of the game. Jamie Dunn. He called my name, and then proceeded to call out my address. The worst sin man can commit is in unbelief. You have to pay for your sins, and your punishment comes swiftly this hour. He stared stiffly into the camera and produced a blood-stained sickle which he rubbed skillfully under his eyes. Truly, he took on the appearance of pure evil because the sight sent shivers down my spine. It was all of that which he said before the screen went blank. My stomach sank, and I froze in terror as his words played over and over in my head. Whatever it meant was not good. My respiration turned shallow, and I placed my hands on my chest to steady my panicked breathing. The more I considered the threat, the more the situation unraveled to me. Manifest Evil, as he called himself, knew my name and my house address. He knew my name and my house address? It was impossible! My heart pounded and I began to perspire. I had never told him my name all the while we had spoken, and from what image I could make of his features, I could tell he was a man given to evil. I scolded myself for not listening to my gut when I had been led to skip him. I picked up my phone frantically and dialed the emergency numbers in fear. The phone beeped, and I immediately began to regret having called. In the mire of my own thoughts, I could not make out a stream of clear thinking which I could present to the police. Well, I called, and they took up the call. An officer who introduced himself with a mouthful told me to stay calm. Then I could sense how dismissive he was. 
it occurred to me too that it was ridiculous to believe an Omega user whom I ticked off could follow through on a murder threat. Yet, somehow, I could tell that Manifest Evil was no murderer. He was a killer. He felt no purpose in his action, and he gained no thrill from it besides the need to quell instinct. I tried to explain, but the connection to the police went off. I sat in silent disbelief, wondering if I was indeed being terrified over nothing, even though I could sense danger closing in, suffocating me. I turned off my computer and sat still for minutes that multiplied as I thought of ways to assess and articulate the danger I felt. It didn't make sense, but it worsened until I was completely drenched in sweat. I knew to trust my gut when the vision of his vicious face flashed across my mind. I turned my hand over and wiped off the sweat that had beaded along the line of my head, and I called the cops again. I whimpered and exaggerated the incident as much as I could, wondering why I had done so myself. It was worth it, because as soon as I was done speaking, I was assured that a patrol team was on its way to my house. I hung up the call, and at the same time, a persistent knock came at my door. Oxygen dragged its way through my nostril. I panicked. Who's there? I'm here to collect. A cryptic answer returned to me. I gasped at the surreality of the moment. He truly was at my door, and I could not be more grateful that I had trusted my gut. His voice was unchanged. Who? I asked, and sirens blaring began to approach. The Maize was short-lived because he thwacked my door with his sickle, tearing into the wood with all of his might to get to me. I felt myself tumbling through emotions as I beheld my worst nightmare in real time. He whacked the door a couple more times as the cop's siren grew louder until I was numb to all sensation. When there was some space through the door so we could both see each other, he smashed his shoulder. Life reeled so unbelievably slow that I fell into passivity. One shot broke through the air and I snapped from my reverie as I watched him fall away from my door. The cops rushed up towards him and pee trickled down my pants as I felt relief flush through me. He's dead, the cops declared. 